Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca. He invented the Canadian Insider Index, which is used by the Horizons Canadian Insider Index ETF, a 2017 and 2018 Fund Data Fund Grade A Plus award winner, his website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Well, it's great to be back, Jim, and hello to all your listeners, and thanks for tuning in. Ted, has the shine gone off gold? Well, as we talked about two weeks ago here on House Street, I was a little concerned that we'd see a, a fair amount of insider profit-taking in the gold group, and it got me thinking, well, why why, could, why would that be? And one of the uh, conclusions that uh, we came to and wrote about it in our Top 40 report for the, for the month was that you know Joe Biden initially might make bullion look a little boring because uh, in, wake, in the wake of uh, four years of Donald Trump, uh, Joe Biden may actually come across as himself being you know, relatively boring, and I don't mean that in a negative, uh, negative context. I just mean it sort of in a relative context compared to Donald Trump, where you know every press conference was more or less uh, free uh, entertainment. You never know what to expect from a Donald Trump uh, news conference. Whereas I think, you know, should Joe Biden win, I think his press conferences will be quite predictable. So for gold, I think uh, the gold market uh, and gold investors are starting to look a little further down the road here. And, you know, I just, I don't have any skin in the U.S. election game. And I, I, I you know, so I, I can look at this impartially. I think, you know, th- right now, Joe Biden looks like he's going to win. Now I say that knowing that there is a debate coming up. But, uh, and I know I'm not going to make any, I know uh, there's a, there's, there's, it's very polarized in the U.S., and Trump supporters don't want to hear that maybe Donald Trump is, is not going to win. But this isn't about politics. This is about how to position, you know, your investment portfolio. So let's just try and take out for a moment the who should win and who shouldn't win, and who's, who, you know, who will be the better president, who would be, you know. Let's just take a look at what's unfolding right now. And we've got Joe Biden with a significant lead in the national polls at 7%. Dipped a little bit on the news of the Supreme Court vacancy, but I don't think that's sustainable. His lead has been significant for months, and Donald Trump, in my in my opinion, his last really chance at, at kind of reversing course here, I'm building on a little, little bit of gas he's going to get from the Supreme Court nomination, uh, is to win hands down, you know, the debates that are coming up, and I think the next, the first debate is September 29th. Just to, not to go too far in the weeds on political analysis, though, I want to say two things. First of all, yes, I know the polls were wrong last election. They had Hillary ahead, but they had Hillary ahead by two points, more or less, not seven. And it was close. Uh, yeah, it was, it was almost within the margin of error. Currently, Joe Biden is not within the margin of error, really. He's actually well above that. And, you know, the uh, the other uh, point that, uh, you know, I think that we should keep in mind here is that not only is, you know, Joe Biden uh, ahead, uh, you know, I think that we've got a situation where the Trump campaign has hasn't really helped itself broaden its support base and it, got, it, it in a sense got lucky with this Supreme Court vacancy and I you know I don't mean to use that you know distastefully but politically 
I mean, now they can en- energize their base uh, and, and get their base out uh, to vote uh, to you know to, to maintain uh, the momentum that uh, on getting a conservative on the Supreme Court. That's a positive, but they have made the bar so low for Joe Biden in these debates that it's not really going to be hard for Joe Biden to surpass the low bar that they've set for him. And that's my two cents on the political analysis. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a likely Joe Biden win. And it leaves us with either a gridlocked Congress if the Republicans can take control, or if the Democrats pick up a couple of seats, and it looks like now they could, but that I'm certainly not as confident on that as I am about Joe Biden winning in terms of the outlook. Uh, then you've got a uh, more of an open field for the Democratic agenda. But I think right now, though, what what the, the gold market is telling you is that, well, look, you know, we're going to have a boring president. And right now, it's not clear that any of these new spending initiatives are going to go through. So... In the short term, the risks to a fiscal blowout have receded, and the risks to a uncertain outcome in the U.S. election have also receded because Biden is so far ahead in the polls. The media are trying to make this thing about, oh, it's going to be too close to call, it's going to go to the Supreme Court, oh, we may not know for much. Here's my prediction today. Unless Joe Biden stumbles in the debate, right, if you know if they're in an election held today, it will not be close, and there will be no there will be no uh, yeah, ambiguity as to who won. And I think the markets that's the way the markets are positioning right now. Now, where there is ambiguity is on the spending on who wins the Senate, and we probably we may not know this that answer for a while. So I think that's holding gold back because it would do much better if Trump were ahead because we we know uh, what uh, his spending plans would be. They would be big. They would be bold, and uh, they, you know. And, and he's also uh, not, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't resist. Uh, he doesn't pull punches too often geopolitically. Now, you know, I think he gets. I think he gets uh, framed as a hawk. Uh, uh, mistakenly, I don't think he is a hawk. But uh, in terms of uh, geopolitical risk, I do think he kind of stirs the pot a bit, and that's also good for gold. Uh, you know, we could have geopolitical problems at any time, and that's one reason why, you know, gold uh, always has a place uh, in a portfolio, I believe. Uh, but in terms of uh, being a money maker on the back of this, you know, inflation-driven uh, Trump agenda, you know, I think you're seeing money con- coming off the table because of that. And, uh, you know, we will da- now have to wait. I think gold is going to have to wait for uh, you know, bigger pullback here on gold stocks to get another momentum up, some kind of geopolitical spark. You know, we'll be watching the insiders. We'll be watching to see their buying pick up. Uh, right now, we haven't got a short-term buy signal, but I can tell you that over the long term, it's still very bullish. So the overall structural case for gold as a hedge against uh, you know government deficits and inflation down the road. Or you know, if you're in the deflation camp, even deflation, a deflationary bust, it was still pretty strong. So where I'm coming from is uh, on the short term, and I'm going to leave you with one final uh, on this question about gold. Uh, that's uh, you know, that's you know, I think a warning sign is, we've, and I, we talked about this in our reports, and we talked about this two weeks ago. The gold silver ratio is now back over 80 today, and that is not what you want to see if you're you know a, a, a uh, if you're really uh, looking for, for example, silver to outperform, and uh, you know, silver, uh, yeah, silver, and, and sort of inflation-oriented stocks to outperform. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, what we call the de economy, the deflation debt-driven economy. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's it's having its turn here. That's not a surprise. We've had a good run on the inflation side. We've had a good run on gold. We've had a good run on silver. And all those assets. So it's not not a big surprise that we're seeing a bit of a pullback here. I think it, again, I think it's short term, but you know, I don't think it's a matter of this bouncing in a few days. I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times before. I will be wrong many times again. But uh, you know, I just uh, just over the, the the little over the next little while, if if Joe Biden does really well in the debate, you know, I think you could see even more weakness uh, in the gold silver complex ahead. 
We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, do you see an emerging theme happening in investment? We're starting to put together our fall rebalancing presentation for the Canadian Insider Index, and we've been reviewing all all our themes. And one of the new ones that we're working on, I'm actually sharing it really uh, first here on Al Street. I, I made a short reference to it in our market report on Monday. But the theme of innovation and improvisation, you know, the uh, the one thing that I think everyone in the world has now been confronted with and accepted is change because of the COVID-19. So where I think, you know, in many cases, people prefer things to stay the same, the status quo, not everyone, but just, you know, there's a, a large group uh, in the population and a different parts of your life that you just hope it will stay the same. You know, you hope you keep your job. You don't want to lose your job. You know, things like that. And, you know, you you, let, you want things to work all the time. You know, you get into routine. You know, when, you know, you know when the kids are going to go to hockey, you know, when, you know, you, you know when you're going to retire. I mean, all those things, you know, you'd like to have plan ahead. Well, we've, we've all, just about all of us, have been confronted with having to uh, improvise over the last six months. And I think that's going to be a theme going forward in the stock market. And it, and it, that's what we've got our eye on at companies that have improvised and who are, you know, willing to make change and to innovate. So, you know, what's interesting, this, co- this can cover a broad range of companies. You know, we of course, we have the darlings like Zoom who were well positioned for improvisation to facilitate it and, you know, who had already done the innovation ahead of time. So they've, they've been able to rightly cash in on that. But you've got a lot of stocks under the radar that are improvising and that are doing different things. And one of the areas that we wrote about today, and there is a free 90-second uh, video on Key Insider uh, about uh, Crew Energy today, which is a oil and gas stock. And one of the things we point out there is their focus on greenhouse gas management. And you've got more and more oil patch companies focusing on the impact of greenhouse gases and how they're looking to reduce it. So this is improvisation. And it's also innovation. And I think it, you know, it, it may be setting the, the, the stage for a bottom. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say that, but I did. There we go. But, uh, you know, a, a bottom or turnaround point, uh, for the oil patch, which everyone hates, uh, uh, Tony Greer, who is, uh, who writes a newsletter out of the United States, who is on our Inc. Ultra Money platform yesterday, he, he labeled the uh, energy sector as kind of, the, you know, the criminal sector, right? Well, every, you know, it, it, it's almost like everyone, you know, if, if you're involved with oil and gas, it's like, uh, it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost a crime. You're polluting the environment, right? And he's being facetious, of course, and so am I. But, um, yeah, it's it, it's had a bad rap, but you know there are good things going on in that in that sector, and they are making a contribution to doing their part in reducing greenhouse gases, and that's getting at this point no recognition. But will it never get? Will it, will, will that always be the case? You know, we've had a lot of bad news priced in to the uh, oil and gas sector, so you know I think there is a case for. Companies that are improvising and that are innovating. You know, we've just uh, heard from California today that uh, they're planning 
to ban the sale of gasoline cars. I think I believe it is 2035, and uh, and I believe uh, trucks is they get a 10, 10 years, uh, an extra ten years. Uh, it's by executive order, I believe. So it's not like they've passed a law yet, but that's where they're headed. So you know that is going to provide an opportunity for companies to innovate and improvise. So you know that's an area that I think. Going forward from out of this pandemic, you've got you've got old you've got old school energy, you've got new energy, and you've got healthcare. So we're actually quite excited about some of the opportunities we see. But you know we do have to get through. Uh, unfortunately, this volatility that we're going to have, I think, going through the election. But uh, even in the U.S., you know, we're starting to see at the stock level some interesting situations where insiders are pointing to companies that are innovating that haven't uh, necessarily been recognized by the market. They're smaller companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, we write about those in our weekly market report. Uh, so, uh, yeah, keep your eye on innovative uh, uh, company, companies that are improvising, and some will be old school. You know, it does, they don't necessarily have to be uh, a new company that's just listed uh, uh, its shares for the first time on, you know, on, on NASDAQ at, you know, at over $100 a share. There are smaller companies and there are old, old school companies that are, that are uh, doing some surprising things under the surface. So that's our, our, our emerging theme that we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, as we work through the, hopefully what is the, the you know, the back end of this pandemic. And uh, we're going to be looking for those companies that are, that are showing that they can improvise and innovate. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. U.S. banks are warning that Bitcoin could be a scam and, and we should be really worried about it. But what about the money laundering that's taking place in big banks like HSBC? Well, we've had a, a very inter- interesting report come out of the United States out of BuzzFeed who uh, did an investigation into the money laundering industry in the United States. And, you know, Financial institutions involved with money laundering, you know, that may not come as a huge surprise uh, to followers of the money laundering file here in Canada, uh, but, you know, it has rocked the boat a little bit in the U.S. This report found that, that there were documents that identified, you know, more than $2 trillion in suspicious transactions uh, in big banks between 1999 and 2017. And what, what's interesting there, though, is that how long have I been hearing that, oh, that Bitcoin and all those cryptocurrencies, oh, you know, they're just used by gangsters and uh, money launderers and it's a terrible thing. And, you know, even, you know, I believe, he thought, you know, Donald Trump, uh, you know, impl- you know, encourages his Treasury Secretary to go investigate Bitcoin for all their, all the bad stuff that goes on there. Well, the fact of the matter is um, most well, not most, all transactions on Bitcoin are public. And law enforcement has figured that out. And so when there are these major kind of scandals, such as the hack into the Twitter accounts of, uh, you know, some of the more famous Twitter users, and there was a blackmail scheme, uh, it didn't take long to find, who the culp- uh, find out who the culprit was. It, because uh, the, uh, the blockchain is public. Now, Bank of Canada has said that uh, they've looked at in privacy on the blockchain, and they're concerned that it's not private enough. Okay, now the, now there are solutions that are being worked on that, that will find a balance, you know, between privacy and uh, being and authorities being able to track the bad guys. And, you know, and not without getting into a lot of detail, you know, one of the solutions that, that, that 
uh, entrepreneurs are looking at is, you know, is there a way to sort of um, make the, the, the transactions private, but it's still associated with a know your client a file that if there was a suspicious, uh, if, the, if the transactions look suspicious, then under the right circumstances, the authorities could uh, identify who the know your client is, you know, who that, who that, who that transaction is associated with by this by this uh, encrypted uh, know your client file, which would be made available uh, on you know under certain circumstances. But you know we're not there yet. But that's that's kind of the solution. I think one of the solutions that's being worked on to try and find out a way to to, to make the blockchain actually more more uh, uh, private. And so this whole kind of notion that uh, the blockchain is just the highway for criminals is really naive. And any criminal who thinks that is going to get busted. So it's, uh, it's, it is ironic though that meanwhile in the, uh, in the, in the old school world, uh, we've got this BuzzFeed report about trillions of dollars of money laundering. So it, again, it, you know, it, it comes back to this theme about I- improvisation and innovation. And, you know, going forward, Jim, you know, it, it is, you know, I think one of the greatest areas of for potential profit is in the whole cryptocurrency blockchain area. There's a lot of innovation going on to try and develop a new financial system, okay? And we talked about this a little bit last week. It's the decentralized financial system. It's in its early days. And look, from the get-go, I, I got to say that just because I think it's got a lot of powerful potential, I also know, the one, I, one thing I have greater certainty in and that the profit potential is the risk potential. It will have a lot of risk. There will be a lot of volatility. You know, there is a risk that there will be no profit, that it will only be losses. There will be big risk. So for someone who is older and is risk averse, you know, the block, blockchain and, and cryptocurrency investments are probably not for them. But if you're a younger person and you're, you know, you're looking for, uh, growth opportunities, you know, now's a, a very good time to start educating yourself on on what's happening in the decentralized finance space because, you know, the banking system, it has benefited from regulation and it's, it's kept a lot of new entrants out. But, you know, the, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies, they are pressing ahead. And they, so this being developed more slowly than it otherwise would because I think of the protections that are being offered by the status, you know, to the status quo system. And, and you know, they're, they're, there's a debate as to whether that's, Justified or not, and, and there's there's pros and cons on both sides. You, you certainly don't want to pull the rug out from under the existing system, but what you don't want to do is discourage innovation either. So we've got, the innovation is happening on, on in decentralized finance, and you know we write about it from time to time in our reports on Ink Chat. We have a blockchain, a cryptocurrency a channel, which uh, you know we you can discuss any time some of the issues that you may have on your mind. So I'd encourage uh, people to subscribe and sign up for that because I think it's going to be one of those areas, uh, you know, of improvisation and innovation uh, that offers a uh, significant potential uh, over the next few years. So it's uh, it's the area that one of the areas I'm most excited about, you know, primarily because I guess I, I cover the finance field and, and it is I, I'm more familiar with finance than I am with biotech, uh, even though there's a lot of exciting things going on in biotech as well. So. Uh, and fortunately, there's a number of public companies in that space uh, that'll, that are going to offer opportunities going forward. But uh, for those of us in the financial area, boy, what's going on in, in decentralized finance on the blockchain? You, you know, uh, you don't want to you don't want to miss that boat if you still got uh, you know uh, more than a decade left uh, in your uh, I think a decade or, or more in your uh, your working life here, especially if you're working in the finance industry. Because uh, you know the, the, the disruption is coming; it's just a question of when. And I don't think it's coming tomorrow, but it may be. You know, next year it may be in five years. I would suspect within ten years, the financial space is going to look a lot different than it is today. Ted, thank you so much for the update. Well, thanks for having me back, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca. If you have any questions for Ted, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. Ted's website, CanadianInsider.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. 
comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.